simple question as we uh, look at uh, verse 31 of Romans chapter 8 is this. In light of all that Paul has talked about up to this point from chapter 1, we'll review a little bit. But it, all we're going to review is based upon this one question. Can a Christian commit a sin uh, that completely uh, truncates, vaporizes, neutralizes their faith? I mean, it's over. Because you committed the one sin that was the last sin that destroyed your salvation. Can you lose your salvation? No. 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 This has been Paul's argument since chapter 1. Uh, and Paul is going to close out his argument on the greatness of salvation in these verses uh, by showing you the surety of your salvation. But before we look at that, we have to go back and look at from whence he's come because he's, a, he's like an attorney building a case. So he's systematically developing the concept that uh, your salvation is secure, vault-like. Uh, and he's going to show why in, as he finishes his argument today. But we want to review the three main themes that he has talked about uh, since uh, chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1 uh, through chapter 3, uh, Paul's first concept is uh, whether you, you are a Jew or a Gentile, all people are born sinners. Uh, you do not get into the world sin-free. Uh, I've told you before as we've gone through that, if you don't believe in the sin nature, have a child. <laughs> right? Because, amen, yeah. Whoever trains them to do sinful things. It just comes with the packaging, does it not? And you laugh because it's so true. Um, so we're all sinners. That's pretty simple. Uh, number two, uh, Jesus' sacrificial death on your behalf, coupled with your faith, justifies you in his court of law. It means you are declared righteous because of your faith in Jesus as your Savior. Uh, number three, and he, he has shown that in chapters uh, three through chapter five. Chapter five was really great. If you remember back then, it's probably about, I don't know, seven, eight months ago, where he said there, the first Adam came and disobeyed God. The second Adam, Jesus, came did not disobey the Father, and he uh, went to the cross uh, and bore our sin. That's chapter 5. Uh, third concept that he talks about is God is providentially at work in your life. That's chapter 8. So uh, through the bad, the good, all the things that happen to you, God's providentially at work, weaving all those webs to accomplish his will, all those different threads. He's building something beautiful in your life. Uh, you must trust his providence. And because he's providentially at work, Paul says, he does some amazing things. Uh, he foreknows you. Therefore, he, he elects you, predestines you to be his child. Uh, he is in his mind justified you in his court of law. And lastly, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, he, he glorifies you. In fact, he uses the past tense because it's as if it's already happened. So in light of all those great things that God has done uh, in your salvation, in his court of law, when you came to him as a believer and said, I trust Christ as the Messiah, uh, you are saved at that moment. Does he ever unsave you? No. And Paul's going to show that to be true as we look at this passage. Now, does that mean that you as a Christian always act like a Christian? Only five people are. No, no, no. Why are you at church? <laughs> to grow. Because you probably blew it somewhere along the line this week. And this is kind of like fine-tuning, isn't it? That was Romans 6. Remember Romans 6? Uh, where Paul says, you know, you're not slave to sin anymore like you were when you were non-Christian, doing what sin called you to do. You're like a puppet. Uh, but now, he says in uh, 6.19, you're free. Don't live that way anymore. So the command is based on the premise that you can choose to live your old selfly nature, and that's probably why you're in church, to help not do that again. Uh, in chapter 7, remember chapter 7? The thing I wish I would do, I do not, etc. That's, well, that can be like a given day, can't it be? Uh, and so Paul's going to say in chapter 8, um, is, uh, is still reviewing, is that as a believer, you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You have the ultimate power. You just have to unleash that power by yielding to his, his will in your life. So in light of all that, Paul's going to summarize his argument about the greatness of justification by faith, not by works, but by faith in Jesus' work. Here's what he says in verse 31. It's culminating his argument. And if you're a pianist, uh, this is him, this is like a, a crescendo at the end of a really awesome piece that was pianissimo. You follow? Am I talking to a pianist here? Anybody? Yeah. Who did not know what I just said? <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, the crescendos, you're building to a climax, etc. What shall we then say of these things that I've just been talking about for eight chapters? If God is for us, logical question, who's against us? Uh, he, he, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, leads to another question. Will it, how will he not also with us give us everything freely? How could he not? Uh, another question he asks, who, who will bring a charge against God's elect? He says, well, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who then condemns? 
Well, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Leads to another question, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Answer, nothing. nobody or nothing. Then he says, well, let me give you some ideas in case you need some ideas to think about what might possibly separate you from the love of God. Will tribulation? No. no. Um, distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. Just as it is written by quoting Psalm chapter 44, verse 22. He says, for your sake, we are being put to death as believers all the day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered by the godless world. He says, I understand Psalm 44. But in all of these things, he says, we as Christians are overwhelmingly known as conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. He says, for I am convinced. And if you read Greek, it's the perfect tense, which means a past act with an abiding result, which means I will never stop being convinced of what I'm about to say. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, and that's a, a Greek word for demonic beings, and there's several of them here because they're stratified in rank. He's mentioning them. So I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, another name for a demonic being, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you lose what he gave you? No, you cannot. Short sermon, we're done. I hop, here we come. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah, because we need to talk about this, don't we? Oh, you're almost there. So. Believer's salvation is safe and secure. That's the motif of the passage. So how do we know that? Three lines of evidence. Evidence number one. Remember, he's like an attorney. He's going to give you the, the proof of God's love, shows you that it is perpetual. It's permanent. Notice what he says, verse 31. What shall we say then of these things? Uh, th this is terminology that you would use in a Grecian uh, court of law, that particular formula. Um, Paul loves this technique. It's woven all throughout his, uh, his books, and I isolated those in my notes if you want to find all the places where he uses that formula. He loves to build his point to an argument like to the jury. We've been talking about how does the sinner find the Savior? Well, it's not by the sinner's work. It's by the work of Christ. He said, well, let's talk about the summation of that argument, a justification by faith. What shall we say then in light of all that we've said about that? Well, he said, I have some Socratic questions. Now, why is it good to pose a Socratic question? First of all, let's ask, what's a Socratic question? Which leads to another question. Who's Socrates? Who cares? <laughs> Socrates, really known for asking questions. So if you pose a question to somebody that's asking you questions and you pose them a question, which Jesus did all the time, uh, what does it do to the person in question that you're questioning? It's getting them to think. What's our culture love to do? Scream and yell. Rhetoric has replaced reason. Has it not? Watch television. Has it not? Am I lying? I mean, screaming and yelling has replaced reason. In fact, they, they think screaming and yelling is an argument. It is not. Paul says, let's reason through this. Let me, let me ask Socratic questions to get you to think. So he, he poses a first Socratic question. Simple. It's conditional clause. If, then. Well, if God is for us, leads to the logical question, Who's against us? I mean, who could possibly be against us? If God is on your team, or the captain on your team, I mean, how could anybody...